Um, just before I get started, I'd like to thank the centre and um, Professor Frame for inviting me here today. Um, I must have had a pretty good proposal because I can assure you my CV is the most unspectacular thing I've ever written. Um, I am uh, the most junior and least educated speaker today. Um, but it must have been a pretty good, good idea that I wrote because it touches on a couple of common threads from the other presentations today. The idea of the risk of getting thin on ideas, um, of encouraging junior airmen to think about more than just flying. Um, and that's why I think that this topic is so important. As an institution, the Royal Australian Air Force has had two great failings when it comes to strategy over the past decade. Firstly, we tend to disregard its importance. As of right now, and for much of our history, the Air Force does not have a formally documented strategy that can be widely disseminated, and our contribution to strategic discussion at a national level is almost non-existent. Secondly, we tend to regard strategy as being inviolable. We review strategy far too infrequently and overly rely on direction from above. For an organisation that champions agility as a core value, our few published papers tend to be orthodox reflections of discussions largely available in national newspapers, rather than being the paradigm shifting discussions that should go hand in hand with the acquisition of fifth generation capabilities and platforms. In a speech to the Australian Strategic Policies, Policy Institute's National Security Dinner in July of this year, Chief of Air Force, Air Marshal Leo Davies, delivered what he termed a trailer of Air Force's strategy 2016 to 2026. In that speech, CAF laid out five vectors for the Air Force over the next decade. Joint warfighting, people, communications, infrastructure, and international engagement. According to CAF, a clearly articulated Air Force strategy is essential to focus Air Force's organisational effort, internal decision making, external decision shaping and engagement in communication. And will give a framework in which Plan Jericho can sit. What the vectors don't address, however, is how we develop better strategy, how we address the two failings that I've mentioned previously. For that, we need a sixth vector, strategic imagination. Recruiting, developing and utilising personnel with strong strategic imaginations will ensure that Air Force strategy remains an ongoing topic of importance both internally and externally. Maintaining a constant output of contribution to Air Force strategy will ensure that our strategic guidance is responsive and adaptive in drawing on the best that Air Force has to offer. Before we go any further, let's take a look at the definition of strategic imagination. Brendan Sargent, the current Associate Secretary of Defence, in 2006 in the Army Journal, wrote that imagination is what allows us to create, to turn visions, dreams and desires into something real enough to make us breathe differently and to be able to say that we live in a place we have made our own. It is through our imagination that we connect with the world and create something more, with more meaning and more life out of the crude materials that it gives us. This is a larger definition but imagination is a large thing, capable of spawning worlds. In a business context where the term is more common, Umair Haik in the Harvard Business Review writes that having strategic imagination is to be able to imagine fundamentally new possibilities for truly strategic behaviour. My personal preference is a definition by Dr. Shay Hershkovitz, who identifies strategic imagination as being a product of the interaction between descriptive imagination, creative imagination, and challenging imagination. That is to say, being able to see and explain what is there in a new way, being able to see and explain what is not there, and being able to challenge what both is and isn't there already. The global rules-based order has entered a period of unprecedented tension, with conflicts and potential conflicts between a variety of state and non-state actors, demonstrating the ability to rapidly and unpredictably strike at civilian populations. As such, the ability to engage our strategic imagination has become increasingly valuable. As an Air Force, we cannot achieve our mission to deliver air, pow air power effects for Australia's interest if we cannot imagine where those interests may lie or what may threaten those interests. Strategic imagination is the key foundation on which we can adopt, continue to adapt and respond faster than our potential adversaries, ensuring that we avoid strategic shock 
while maintaining its decision superiority. As such, a failure of imagination may have dire consequences. What does a failure of imagination look like? The 9-11 Commission wrote in its final report on the tragic events of the 11th of September 2001 that the most important failure was one of imagination. In their view, leaders and strategic intelligence agencies simply did not understand the gravity of the threat that Al-Qaeda posed, and this was reflected in the lack of discussion regarding the possible threat in the public, in the media, and in political circles. Even if the various intelligence agencies had successfully communicated the information and resources available to them, it is unlikely that any would have been able to imagine an attack of that size and scope. As Condoleezza Rice put it a year later, nobody could have imagined a plane being used as a weapon in that manner. That being said, the inability of Al-Qaeda to translate the attacks into achieving its strategic goals was a failure of imagination as well. Al-Qaeda wanted to force US troops and influence to leave the Middle East, allowing Al-Qaeda to establish a caliphate throughout the region. They did not imagine that their attacks, as shocking and devastating as they were, would cause Americans to unite rather than fracture, would cause them to redouble their strength in the Middle East rather than withdraw, and would lead directly to the global war on terror and the invasion of Afghanistan, culminating in the death of Osama bin Laden in 2011. They failed to imagine that their strategy, once in motion, would struggle to achieve the desired end state despite operational success. On a much smaller level, however, there was one successful use of strategic imagination in the lead up to the 9-11 attacks. Rick Rascola was the security director at Morgan Stanley, the largest tenant in the World Trade Center, with 2,700 staff occupying 24 floors of the South Tower and World Trade Center 5. Rascola had predicted the 1993 World Trade Center bombings and anticipated future attacks on the World Trade Center, including the potential for a plane to fly into one of the towers. As a precaution, Ruscola would hold emergency evacuations every three months, despite the opposition from some executives in the company who saw them as unnecessary interruptions. Ruscola's strategic imagination in identifying an ill-defined problem, that of a potential terrorist attack, and implementing a generic solution, emergency evacuations, were put to the test on 9-11. Of the 2,700 employees at Morgan Stanley, only 13 would die during the attacks. Tragically, Ruscola never saw his strategic imagination bear fruit. He was last seen climbing past the 10th floor of the South Tower shortly before it collapsed. His remains were never found. In defense, and in RAF in particular, we have excellent problem solvers. But men and women like Rick Ruscola are not merely problem solvers. They are what I term problem conceptualists. I have no doubt that the vast majority of RAF personnel, if they'd been put into Rick Ruscola's position, and told that a terrorist attack would occur in a year's time, would have done a stellar job in preparing the people in their care for that potential. But they would have to be told. Being a problem solver inherently means being responsive rather than predictive. In the absence of a problem to solve, problem solvers flounder. Precious few personnel would have had the strategic imagination to foresee that potential outcome without being told and find appropriate solution. This is the core ability of a problem conceptualist, the ability to apply their strategic imagination to generate unorthodox and unlikely scenarios and then develop solutions for those scenarios. These are the people that we need to be our Air Force strategists who can transform unknown unknowns into imaginary known knowns in the absence of definitive evidence. At the moment, Air Force's efforts in recognising and promoting strategic imagination are particularly lacking, especially compared to the other services. Of the RAF personnel currently posted to the Strategic Policy and Intelligence Group, the Directorate of Str Strategy and Planning Air Force, Military Strategic Commitments, J-5 Plans at Headquarters Joint Operations Command, and the Australian Command and Staff College, only four people had published any strategic papers in the past five years, with a total of five papers published in that time. These are, in my view, the professionals best placed in the, to apply their strategic imagination for the benefit of the Air Force, and yet the publicly, publicly available literature would indicate that they are not. I have no doubt that the majority of their work may not be suitable for public release, but surely it would be reasonable to expect 
that at least some of it is. There are three logical conclusions for why this might be. Firstly, that our strategic th thinkers aren't writing strategically, which is a gross wastage of talent. Secondly, the disseminating Air Force strategy is not seen as a priority, when appropriately communicated Air Force strategy is actually a key internal and external communication priority. Or thirdly, that none of our strategic thinking can be publicly disseminated, in which case CAF's intent to widely disseminate Air Force strategy 2016 to 2026 is in vain. Whichever reason it is, part of recognising strategic imagination must, to be, must be to encourage our strategic thinkers to publicly publish their thoughts. If they don't, that's identical to their work not existing at all. In the 14 general theme editions of the ADF Journal from the past five years, the official journal of the Australian Profession of Arms, RAF personnel had the equal fewest published authors with just 16, tied with 16 from the Navy and compared to 61 from the Army. More tellingly, RAF Army's most junior author was a corporal, Navy's most junior author was a petty officer, while RAF's most junior authors were squadron leaders. Additionally, of the various strategic papers published by students at the Australian Defence College in the past five years, students at the Group Captain and Air Commodore level, Army had 24 authors, Navy had eight, and the RAF had 15. What these numbers say is that the RAF put significant emphasis on senior personnel undertaking strategic education compared with the other two services relative to size. And as a result, our mandatory contribution to course, from these coursework theses is more common. But in terms of voluntarily con contributing to the ongoing strategic defence discourse in a professional capacity, we're left behind. Our strategic writers and our strategic thinkers tend to be more senior than in the other services. Not only does this exclude the majority of our personnel who may have much to contribute, but it's also a symptom of a systemic failure in how we identify, mentor, and make use of the few naturally gifted junior strategic thinkers that we have. Experience from the Army University in, in the United States is that the military tends to expect strategic leadership beginning from the 06 level, but that the development of strategic genius requires a lifelong endeavor rather than the episodic dipping of selected officers into military education. In their experience, Strategic thinking is solidified by the time an officer is aged between 28 and 32. Strategic education of our personnel must therefore begin earlier, as early as initial military training, and we must provide our junior airmen with avenues to demonstrate their strategic imagination with a view towards developing those with a natural talent as problem conceptualists into Air Force strategists. The simple fact of the matter is, is that there are extraordinarily, extraordinarily few indiv individuals who we can currently public, publicly point to as being Air Force strategists. Within the Air Force, only one name currently stands out, Dr. Sanu Kanakara, the Deputy Director of Strategy at the Air Power Development Centre. In the past five years, he's written or co-authored the majority of what the Air Power Development Centre has published, six Air Power books, eight working papers, and the only CAF paper to be published since 2008. The, mar the vast majority of the few other RAF authors with work published through the Air Power Development Centre appear to be students undergoing either Commanded Staff College or the Australian Defence College, where submission of a, submission of a written thesis in a, is a mandatory part of the curriculum. If a diverse range of perspectives is a critical part of developing meaningful strategy with meaningful contributions from across the organisation, then how is it that we have allowed that great burden to rest on the shoulders of a single individual? How is it that we cannot find a single uniform member or even a group of uniform members who are publicly and voluntarily influencing strategic thinking in the RAF as Dr. Kanakari has? Strategic imagination is especially important to the Air Force compared to the other services, partly because we will always have to stay at the leading edge of techn technological development in aeronautical systems and a variety of technical realms such as cyber and EW and partly because the speed and reach of our platforms means that the government and the Australian people expect us to provide rapid information, rapid options, and rapid solutions. The fact that we appear to produce fewer strategic thinkers, particularly junior strategic thinkers, than both the Navy and Army, should therefore be a cause for extreme concern. 
If the Air Force strategy 2016 to 2026 is to meet CAF's intent of focusing internal decision making, external decision shaping, and engagement and communication, then we must, as a service, strive to improve our capacity to produce imaginative and relevant strategy. To do this, we can learn much from what the Australian Army has done in empowering their workforce to apply their strategic imagination. The Army has a spe spectrum of publications through which their strategic thinkers can be heard. The Australian Army Journal is the primary forum for Army's professional discourse, fac facilitating debate within the Army and raising the quality and intellectual rigour of that debate. The Land Power Forum is a public blog specifically designed by Army to generate informed discussion and new ideas to contribute to Army's modernisation and the future of land power. Grounded Curiosity is a public website maintained by senior Army officers with a blog and podcast that allows junior commanders to communicate directly amongst themselves with senior commanders and vice versa. Externally, the Army also has the Army Research Scheme by which service provided, providers undertake paid research on topics to inform future land force development and modernisation. If the Army sees value in initiatives of this nature, to the point where they're willing to pay other people to help them answer fundamental questions about the future of the Army, then why don't we? Is our need for answers really any less than theirs? So how can we go about utilising the strategic imagination of our workforce in order to produce strategic thinkers? Firstly, we must encourage younger personnel to use their strategic imaginations. They bring in new knowledge and new ideas unfettered by the biases of the establishment, more readily challenging what is there and that not there already. To enable this, junior officers and airmen must have, as an army, a spectrum of avenues through which to publish written work to a professional standard. We need an Air Force journal, managed by the Air Power Development Centre, to be the official journal of the Air Force profession and our highest level single service forum for professional discourse. We need an online blog for shorter written articles to generate informed debate in our junior ranks and to stimulate their strategic imagination. And I note here the work that's been done on Central Blue, the blog by the Williams Foundation. The CAFS essay competition would therefore become a capstone to each year's body of work, with finalists compiled and publicly published as such, instead of the current situation where it's the one opportunity each year to submit written work for reward and recognition. Not only does this improve the communication of Air Force strategy internally and externally, but it'll also allow us to identify problem conceptualists and guide them down the track of becoming Air Force strategists. An individual's portfolio of work could therefore become an indicator for promotion, for selection to attend courses, or to receive defence support for further study. Secondly, we should expect our strategists to write, and to write often, both for internal and external publication even if the opinions of individual writers may be controversial. One of the most noted papers from the Army Research Scheme was by Charles Miller, whose research on cultural sensitivity training in the Army concluded that many members of the ADF hold strongly anti-Muslim sentiments, a conclusion that drew widespread media attention. Rather than quash the research, the Army was published in the Army Journal with a foreword by the Chief of Army, Lieutenant General Agnes Campbell noting that challenge is a good thing and that this study requires us to value intellectual diversity, challenge conventional thought, and embrace professional and respectful discourse. The more we think about and analyse our profession, the better we become at it. This statement applies equally as much to the Air Force. Some may contend that it is wasteful to dedicate high-performing members solely to the task of, of strategic writing of imagined scenarios when they could be developing real strategic plans. And this is a point that I'll address further in the written paper to accompany this presentation. But very briefly, as President Eisenhower pointed out, plans are worthless, but planning is everything. When you are planning for an emergency, you must start with this one thing. The very definition of emergency is that it is, that it is unexpected. Therefore, it is not going to happen the way that you are planning. Strategic writing is, in a way, strategic planning and can be tuned to, observe, to serve as the observe and orientation phases of John Boyd's OODA loop to avoid strategic shock. Thirdly, we must recognise Air Force strategists as a key capability and develop, develop workforce structures and personal management functions to support that capability. 
Air Force strategy should be a viable, uniformed career option that runs in parallel with a member's primary career pathway, with NEA or NEO postings to the Air Power Development Centre, in the Directorate of Strategy and Planning Air Force, at joint service units such as Strategic Policy and Intelligence and the Military St Strategic Commitments, and in other strategic national organisations. Experienced strategists would there have, therefore have the option of being posted to the Australian Defence College or Command and Staff College to help educate the next generation of Air Force strategists. We should not be afraid to attach strategists to organisations such as the Australian Strategic Policy Institute or the Air University in the United States to further their professional development. We should actively seek opportunities to send our strategists to national and international conferences, such as the Shangri-La Dialogue or the Bratislava Global Security Forum and to undertake postgraduate study either here or overseas so that we can learn from the imaginations of our strategic allies and partners. Finally, our strategic leaders must give strategic imagination the attention it deserves by encouraging the efforts of junior authors. Strategic situational awareness of senior commanders can be improved by ensuring that strategic papers, or at least the executive summaries, reach them and are read. In times of strategic crisis, Senior commanders will be able to call upon those who have already given that particular issue, or a similar issue, some degree of strategic thought. The challenge here is that far too often, programs in the Air Force are tied to individual personalities. And as those personalities leave, those programs tend to fall by the wayside. The buy-in from our senior leaders must therefore continue regardless of personnel changeover at senior ranks, both in recognition of the potential that strategic imagination of our junior workforce offers them but to also ensure that the cohort of strategic thinkers remains active. To conclude, strategic imagination is the missing piece of our current and future Air Force strategy. For too long, we have failed to recognise its importance and instead rewarded its products. But the coming of the Air Force strategy 2016 to 2026 gives us a unique opportunity to remedy that situation by creating professional Air Force publications, by encouraging Air Force personnel to write publicly, by establishing Air Force strategy as a career option, and by ensuring that our senior leaders recognise and support strategic imagination. The consequences, if we fail, are almost unimaginable. The ability for Air Force to effectively generate and apply air power in a fifth generation environment and to remain relevant in the 21st century hinges on our strategic imagination. Thank you. So just help us, Oliver, who are the consumers principally of the things you write and the things you say? Is it the unwashed public who are probably not that interested unless the continent's being invaded? Is it the journalist class? Is it the political class? Or actually is it primarily the wider Defence Force community? So we write these things, who do you see as being the principal consumer? Currently or in the future? Both. I think the ideal end state is that each of those stakeholders has some awareness of Air Force strategy because each of them influences how we do business and how we do business influences them. So in the case of the general public, if the better understanding that they have of Air Force strategy can inform their decision and their view on why we purchase particular platforms such as the JSF, and educating them in Air Force strategy increases, increases the literacy in that into the future. And that affects things like politics. So when political leaders make particular decisions, the better understanding that they have of Air Force strategy and of Air Force strategy in general helps them make better decisions that affect us. So the view is that if a populist politician says, I could quickly find 10, 15, 20 billion dollars, we'll scrap that project, you would want the public to be able to say, no, no, we have a sense in which we need that and they won't necessarily respond to that quick, nasty, well, not, not cheap certainly solution, but a ready-to-hand solution. That's where you think the public would, would not be as gullible as otherwise they might. Exactly right, yes. Thank you. All right, let's take your questions and comments. Uh,
Okay, got it. Uh, g'day, uh, Chris McGuinness, uh, Air Force. Um, so I was at Staff College last year and uh, I think you're probably overestimating the amount of uh, independent thought that's encouraged there at the moment. But um, um, one of the running jokes uh, at Staff College last year uh, about Air Force thinking was um, the limit of our thinking was essentially coming up with new questions to which F-35 was the answer. Um, but that, and, and I think the, uh, the, the slogan that we came up with for the Air Force single service week was, uh, it's like the Lego movie because everything is awesome. Um, and I think that, that, I guess the point I'm trying to make here is I think the, the single biggest challenge that we would face in encouraging this kind of problem conceptualists is that problem conceptualists might point out that some of our current solutions and plans uh, are not all that flash. Uh, and that, they, that may call into question uh, some of the arguments and, and ideas that have gone behind it. And I think you, you rightly acknowledge the, the contribution of Professor Kanakara, but I think some of the uh, some of the work that the Air Power Development Centre does, I think, could be characterised better as advocacy rather than encouraging debate. So it, it advocates air power rather than encourages people to actually ask deep and difficult questions. Um, so I think. And it kind of goes to Wing Commander uh, Pendlebury's point. We've got to encourage diversity of people, but also much more diversity of thought. And the senior leadership, both within the Air Force, Defence and Government, need to accept that there's a whole bunch of noise that goes on around ideas and debate. Uh, you know, the single, the single strongest idea is the one that's been the most thoroughly tested by public and, and in private. So I guess my question for you is, if we did all that, if we had pe people publishing, if we if we had strategists, how do we overcome the institutional fear, reluctance um, of our some fairly core ideas being questioned and called into question and criticised in public by people who may well be wearing a uniform? I think there needs to be a realisation that it's better to ask these questions now rather than when it's a life or death situation, and so the street thinking that we put into it here and asking the hard questions here, even if the answers aren't necessarily maybe all that popular, are important before asking those same questions is attached to a body count. But how much is rank a function? Because you've only been in the Air Force how long? Two years. And so if someone's been in the Air Force 32 years, and might they think that for the duration of my service, I'll just let things run? How would you go about changing the culture so that people would be rewarded rather than punished for asking inconvenient questions? I think part of it is giving people the opportunity and the avenues in which they can ask those questions. And part of it is cultural change by which we need to see those people who are against it maybe moving to retirement. Because that's the only way you can get those views out of uniform. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Oliver, thanks very much. Uh, Callum Brown from the Australian Defence College, which you uh, quoted. Um, a, a couple of observations, perhaps, and maybe a sort of a rhetorical question. Um, first of all, um, the figures that you quoted up there in terms of the Indo-Pacific Strategic um, Digest publications, given the representation of Army, Navy and Air Force students at the uh, Defence and Strategic Studies course, we're batting pretty well. Uh, in terms of senior Air Force <coughs> officers getting strategic papers out there. Um, one of the other things uh, that it's um, become um, pretty obvious um, to a lot of our senior people is finding the time to sit back and think about the strategic issues and then publish them um, and, uh, and uh, get them out there. So I'd uh, be interested if you had any ideas about how to make the time and space for people to think and write. Thanks. Um, the point you make about senior thinkers not having the time, that's the same for junior, the junior workforce. So when I speak to junior officers and I, we talk about strategy and they say the most common complaint is that they don't have the time to actually sit down and do, to write because they're too busy doing and their expectation is that they're too busy doing. So part of it is, as I agree, is that we need to give people the time to actually write and to think and part of that is in recognising the importance of, what, uh, of their strategic imagination of actually giving them the time to do so. So having avenues and making it a trackable kind of output, so in the PPR, um, in performance development, in professional development, um, in lieu of maybe PMET, 
um, giving them tangible outcomes for why they should be doing this might help improve that in terms of finding reasons why they should. Great, thank you. Can I just follow up? For the first time next year, um, creative thinking has been added to the course for the Defence and Strategic Studies course. We've had critical thinking for many, many years, and for the first time at a student, uh, student initiated suggestion, we have added creative thinking to the, the uh, fundamental aspects of the course. G'day, Oliver. A wing commander, Jason Begley, CO10 Squadron. Uh, as is my want, and you probably got this from my own presentation, I'm just going to ask a couple of leading questions for both you and, and the audience. So how many, uh, how many blogs or comments otherwise have you seen from senior leadership on the Central Blue? Um, I, had, I only found out about it today when Squadron Leader Harlan mentioned it. Um, okay. Yeah. So n not particularly well advertised, shall we say, mm. but... I would suggest there's a role there for our senior leadership to really advocate for that, draw attention to it, put their own comments on it. They don't necessarily need to devote hours to generate 5,000 words, perhaps just a short little foreword to an article or a comment or just respond to something someone else has, uh, has provided. I'll just digress slightly and, uh, and ask a, a question up the back here. So Guinness. How many, uh, how many essays have you suggested to, uh, submitted to the CAF essay contest now? Yeah, one. one. Did anyone win that year? No. No. So people submitted essays and on the whole, would you suggest yours wasn't very well liked because it questioned uh, some pretty significant foundation theories? Yeah, so that's why I got $2,000 the year before and he did not. So, but this is, to me, important. A lot of it, to me, is, is about leadership. Um, you know, Trav had his shameless self-promotion earlier about the Central Blue. I'll do my own shameless self-promotion. Every Thursday, and I had my phone pinging before to tell me that Strat Chat was on in my crew room. I invite everyone at the squadron. I have an L LAC who's doing a university degree, he will come along and he will contribute to strategic discussions on what is China doing in the South China Sea? What is the role of leadership? What is the role of creative thinking in Air Force? And how does that contribute to where we need to be in 2025, 2026? Open forum, rank off, come along, give your opinions. Let me assure you, the opinions you get from a 52-year-old flight engineer whose whole career has been power levers going forward and back can sometimes be surprisingly insightful. And that's the thing, you know, we tend to, to just focus on identity. Uh, we tend to look for people to discuss things with who are similar to ourselves when we could actually invite a lot of input from a lot more people in our own organisation. Thanks. Um, no, I think that highlights exactly, like there is a deep pool there of potential that's untapped in the Air Force and recognising strategic imagination, giving outputs for it is part of tapping into that um, for the benefit of all, all of us into the future. We're out of time. We could continue talking. I hope though that people are, the people who are doing things that are creative and encouraging thought uh, might perhaps either be in touch with Oliver or find a way of, if you're doing something creative, let more people know about it. Certainly that would be great. Uh, I really enjoyed what he had to say. Would you please join me? Yes. Welcome.